Hello, I'm going to go ahead and give a little introduction. I'm Danny Bell, Danny Bellavita, formerly Danielle Gennetti, um, with my corporate and legal identity, and um, I'm sitting here in a corporate uh, meeting room right now, about to have a, a lovely interview with a dear friend of mine, Zachary Town Smith, who I have co-facilitated some community building um, facilitation of the development of skills for transformation, which both of our uh, facilitation styles come from a bit of a corporate background. So we're going to meet here at the intersection of corporate skill building and community building. Um, and we both brought, uh, have a slightly different background in where we developed our, our skills that we found um, compatible in working in community and developing the relationships and the teams that can function really well together. Um, and these are skills that were taught to both of us for use in corporate America. Uh, for myself, through um, many working for a couple decades at a variety of corporations. For Zach, it was through his uh, academic training at, at Harvard University. So hopefully Zach will join us here in just a moment. In the meantime, I'll give you just a little bit more more information. This is my second episode of I'm calling this descending the corporate ladder from glass ceiling to grassroots uh, because uh, sharing my personal experience, which is really all I can do, I can tell you, I can go out and have the greatest experiences, be willing to take the leap, land hard, learn what I can, and share back with people. Um, maybe another way down. Uh, and that's what this is about now. Um, there's a lot of skills that need to be practiced and developed. It's hard to practice and develop something in an environment that doesn't have the skills, uh, skilled folks to hold that space, provide that structure that allows us to learn, uh, to learn those skills, to get guidance, um, not only from people with a little bit more experience and training and hopefully good intentions for our well-being as well as the well-being of the team. Um, and then those skills, once we've developed them, you know, we kind of need to sustain ourselves. A lot of times the way our current education system is, you got to go into debt, big debt, to get your training. But that training, is schooling. You're being schooled. Here's what we want you to take out into the world. It's not necessarily what you came here to the world to be, to share, to do. You're picking a career path and you're paying someone a whole bunch of money to teach you information may or may not actually be valid at this point. You know, a lot of these systems were created a long time ago in order to build a workforce. Um, so you're being told what and how to be in order to sustain yourself. You're looking for how do I get a job? How do I take care of myself? How am I going to feed myself, my family, provide a home, um, have the life, right? So you can go to school. I took a slightly different route. Um, I did go to school, but I went to a very short, this was back when computers were beginning. So I did a one year program at a computer institute. I graduated at the top of my class through that one year of training and got the plum job, right? I was picked because I was at the top of my class to get a consulting position at General Motors. And then I was blessed from that point forward, really, blessed to have amazing bosses, to have the opportunity to help people and do things in a nice way. Okay, I see my guest joining me here. So, well, I can see, Zach, that you're coming. I don't, there you are. Hello. Hi. 
Hi, Danielle. How you doing, Zach? I'm great. How are things with you? Oh, they're really good. Um, uh, it's kind of fun. The way I wrote up this interview for you was to meet at the, I'm doing a thing called Mobile Intersections. And as I move about and intersect with people, places, um, I can do these transmissions to share what we're exchanging with other people who might be interested in coming down these roads, these paths where we're meeting. Um, and today you're out in this beautiful, out on the land there is, that I got to come visit. And I'm sitting here in a conference room at Cox Communications in Atlanta. <laughs> All right. Well, far through you. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I got uh, I'm I'm here to do some passport. You know, sometimes in order when we get to that intersection and there's a gate and the road we want to go down, they're like, you, "We must see your papers in order for you to pass." <laughs> yeah. So I'm here getting my papers so I can head back to Costa Rica. Um, and I just did a little introduction for people who joined us as the recording started a few minutes ago about um, building up the skills in the different ways that we can uh, through team building in, in a corporate or a corporately academic setting and then taking those skills and running with them to use them in community. Um, and I did a little bit of peeking um, at what's written up about you out there uh, seeing what you did after you left Harvard in 1999, going out to Guatemala, uh, working with the Earth Rights Institute, and what you learned out there working in community, which it seems like you then brought back to the States a little bit. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that, about leaving school, what you acquired in your professional training through Harvard, um, and what inspired you to take that directly to community building instead of going and getting a job? A job. Right. <laughs> right. J O B. I I uh, I finished my four-year undergrad at Harvard somewhat reluctantly. I, uh, by the end of my second year, I was, I was ready to be out of that setting. I was pretty well done with the, the ivory tower. Um, I was doing a lot of, of classes and sort of movement in my life. I had, I had shifted from a biology major to an African American studies major. And I was looking at, um, one class I took that was very powerful, impactful was a class on, uh, was a graduate level seminar on uh, race, power and politics in Brazil. Mm. Uh, and I had gone to my first capoeira class and I was um, very aware of power differences. Um, I grew up in Philly, went to public schools and had a really diverse um you know education uh and within that definitely i mean you can't be alive in this country and not notice the the the, the differences that that exist for different people according to ethnicity um culture skin color uh socioeconomic status etc um mm -hmm. so that was all really present for me and at harvard uh it was I was a little bit of an outsider. I, I ended up going there because that was the place that gave me the most financial aid. Um, not only because of that, right? But <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I got in, and once I was in there, it was actually the cheapest place for me to go of the schools that that uh, I was accepted to. Um, mm -hmm. So that I was doing summer summer work and in work study and and a little bit outside of the. The, the the general envelope there in, in Harvard and it felt kind of like a glorified summer camp to me um, you know mm -hmm. the social scene and the 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 studying was great I was learning things but I was learning things I really felt like within an ivory tower so I, I went to my mom and I said that's it you know I'm just I'm gonna do like you did I'm gonna finish college later you know I'm gonna 
just go learn some things on my own and take a while, go drive down to Brazil. And my mom very rarely offers uh, uh, directive advice. <laughs> does, it's a good thing to listen. Um, she said, you know, I had a horrendous time trying to finish school after I dropped out, you know. Um, it's so much easier to just go through, just do it now, do it in four years. Um, so I did. Uh, I, I, I followed my mom's advice. I got to take some time abroad. I spent some time in Venezuela uh, doing a work study there um, right before Hugo Chavez was, was elected in 98. Um, fascinating experience and I learned Spanish. And, and so by the time I got to my senior year, uh, I was uh, very much aware of the, the push toward corporate America um, and using the, the Harvard, um, what we learned to uh, make money, essentially. Um, right. the, the, the keynote speaker at our graduation uh, was uh, the um, Greenspan, Alan Greenspan, the head of the Fed. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, uh, he gave his speech, uh, me and a few others, uh, staged a bit of a walkout, uh, went outside of the Harvard grounds onto, uh, Harvard Square, and there was a, a, a professor from the Women's Studies Department who was holding a uh, counter, uh, talk where they encouraged us to use our education for the benefit of the world rather than for our own economic benefit. Um, and that was really powerful to me, for me. And, and I, by that point, I already knew I had uh, found a, a photography project that was uh, looking for volunteers to help work with students uh, in Guatemala City who were living on the dump and were learning photography as a way of, of uh, changing their socioeconomic situation. So I did that. It was a six-month gig, and I liked it. I ended up down there. Um, the, the particular... Uh, academic skills that I had picked up at Harvard um, actually propelled me into an academic career in, in Guatemala. I was working at a Jesuit university for about three years in the communications department teaching photography and then also teaching a class on culture, um, doing research with, uh, with the World Health Organization on adolescent health and media. Um, so it was very much uh, a key for me to get into this, uh, this academic setting um, where, else, where otherwise I would not have had the credentials. And, and beyond that, it was also, you know, I was grading papers in Spanish um, of students that were a couple years younger than me um, in the communications department. Um, and I was pretty, uh, you know, was not very impressed with the level in general of, of communication that they had. And I think part of that was because I had been writing, you know, intensive papers for all my courses for the past four years on a, on a Harvard level. So I definitely, right. think, you know, that kind of thinking process and pattern uh, prepared me. My, one of my mentors in Guatemala, uh, John Dunn, uh, he's, he's an education, creative education uh, field and philosophy of education is his PhD, which he um, did at Temple, but he did a master's program at Penn. And he always makes fun of me for going to to, to Harvard, you know, he's like, yeah, yeah, we're doing our best to, to, to pull you out of that square mold, but you know, Harvard really screwed you up. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I definitely get that of kind of like the, the getting, getting into this normed, uh, state was, was took, took a while of working on creativity and creative applications and developing, uh, new curriculum for the National Ministry of, of Education in Guatemala through piloting programs in rural settings, um, working with teachers, understanding their their challenges and really helping them develop ways to, to bring more creati creativity out of their students. So yeah, there's lots of ways in which um, those those skills and those uh, those experiences I had in sort of the upper echelons of uh, elite uh, Ivy League education were useful for me in not only getting myself in the door, you talked about keys, right? But that, that big H on my diploma um, it was pretty much the same as a master's degree uh, for me, I found. I don't have a master's degree, but because I went to such an elite school and because I, I graduated with cum laude honors and like um, 
it's been sort of enough uh, credential. And I think credential is really uh, important for lots of people in lots of realms. Um, yeah, so that's a somewhat long-winded answer to your, uh, to your question. No, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so there was two things you said that, um, that I wanna, add. the first one is I found it really interesting when I was looking and, and you just said it, you spoke um, about creative education. And when I hear those two words together, creative education, my brain wants to split because the first thing I hear is creative ways to educate. And then the second way my brain goes is educating in creativity, right? right. Um, and, uh, you know, I've got, you got to meet my grandson, right. Loki, and uh, he just finished kindergarten, which I was very opposed to formal education for him at one point, um, but he really wanted to go, so his mom let him go. And I look at some of the things he brings home. Uh, one of them, uh, what recently uh, that I looked at a paper said, uh, at, the pilgrims came to the United States and the Native Americans helped them build houses and then they got education. And my, I, I kind of exploded at that point on the inside, just realizing the implications of all that, because you um, just expressed that it was 1999, late 90s, and you're looking into power and privilege and race dynamics. And this is something that has really only become something that mainstreamed in just these last few years kind of became something that people talk about, understand, know about unless you chose it as a field of study or had an experience abroad in some way or with a, an international cultural exchange experience that triggered your interest, right? So uh, what I heard from you is, an in, you know, you had this intersection of interest in power dynamics and using your skills to help those who do not have the same privilege that you do and doing that in a realm of education for creativity. Can you tell me more about that? Yeah, um, the term that uh, another of my mentors, uh, Gerard Puccio, and uh, use at the at the Institute for Creativity Studies in Buffalo State is creative self-efficacy, um, which is essentially believing that you have the power to be creative, that you have the power to find uh, innovative new solutions to the challenges you face in life. And the more, you know, I, I did community organizing in Philly for a while um, after, like, I, I was in Guatemala, I was doing the academic thing in Guatemala, and I, my time abroad, as you've probably uh, experience, you know, things happen, relationships and visas run out. Like uh, I, I was ready to come back to the States. So I did, uh, I found a, a job with a, uh, a former, somebody that had done an internship at an organization called Eastern Pennsylvania Organizing Project in Philly. Um, and I was uh, working with uh, a faith-based community organizing uh, model, um, meeting people and helping them um, identify and then uh, develop uh, strategies around issues that that were most important to them in their communities, um, so building leadership through uh, addressing the, the the deepest challenges in the community. Um, very powerful, informative work for me. And but what I realized was that um, while I had lots of tools for for relating, communicating, doing lots of one on ones, uh, helping them build understanding, meetings, and things like that, I didn't have any tools to help them think more creatively. And at the end of the day, um, a lot of the community organizing that was happening in, in that sphere was relying on the organizer to come up with the creative twist to then allow them. So my boss, uh, one of his big things was um, that he worked on in Camden was um, an incinerator that, that brought human waste um, to an incinerator that was nearby a community. So the community, one of the things that they ended up doing was packaging up all their waste in brown bags and putting them on the front lawn of the CEO of the organ of the company that was making money off of doing that. So right. that was powerful. And the thought of doing that was came out of the, the, the organization came out of one of the leaders. The leader said, you know, uh, well, let's just bring it to him. 
And at that point, that rolled into that. And that's a really beautiful example of how that, um, how that can happen. But I think uh, what I was missing was those kind of uh, tools to help people into those situations where those creative kinds of ideas can, can come about. And, uh, and I ran into, um, I, was, I was living with a, a friend in Guatemala who was working with the, the Ministry of Culture. And at that point, the, the Minister of Culture was very interested in creativity and education for creativity. Um, mm -hmm. And he brought in a, a, a group of experts uh, from around the world. And I don't like that word expert, and we can talk about that in a little while, but people that were very experienced in the field of creativity and working with creative to build a core group of facilitators around Guatemala that would be uh, facilitators of creativity. Because this creative self-efficacy uh, was clearly more and more clearly for me all the time the the root of of what communities need uh, they don 't need uh, solutions they need the the recognition of their own ability to create those solutions um, and then of course support building them but it 's that very base I am a creative person and and now that I, I, I do uh, yoga teacher trainings, I, I understand it within the context of this self-esteem, uh, understanding, you know, the ways in which I uh, can, can bring myself forward. Because if I don't believe in myself, I don't have the ability to, to I'd much rather copy something from somebody else. It's, it's, a, right. it's, very, it's a very difficult and uh, risky process anytime you do anything creative. So... I was working with um, this friend in Guatemala uh, to build a, an NGO, which we called Imahitlan, which means a place of the imagination. And, uh, and it was to build a, a world where, where people were, were more ac accessing their creativity in ways, and not only individually, but in groups as well. And from there, I've developed a, a collaborative design model that, that helps people come together uh, to develop these these kinds of innovative solutions using processes that build the team and that develop individual self-efficacy as well as group and community self-efficacy to address the deepest challenges that they identify themselves. And that's where where things get difficult in terms of traditional NGO models uh, because okay. NGOs work on issues. Yeah. So I'll pay you you know, $10,000 if you work on the water in this community. And then I go to the community and find out that there's deeper issues or there's other things that they're interested in. And then mm -hmm. how, how do I work that out with my donor? Um, often you can't. And, and so, right. so I spend f time trying to figure out how to interest these people in the issue that I've got money to work on them with. Um, right. And that's just one of the ways in which NGOs also the idea of, of bringing projects in has become a, a sort of an, a, an expected thing in these communities. They, they just sit there with their hands out until the next project comes along and there are these brokers that are good at talking to the international community and then uh, figuring out who fits in what jobs and very often that replicates the power structure in these communities which exists exactly. often based on a military, especially in Guatemala with the, the militarization of the private society in the 80s that happened yeah. as, a, as a strategy against the, the guerrilla um, war that was happening. Um, so that so that people- That was happening and the US was actually- hmm. yeah, yeah, we could go down a rabbit hole there. Yeah. Um, but the point is that the, to really get into uh, the, the, the reimagination, the, the, inno the social innovation in these, in these communities requires uh, going in there, bringing diverse sectors together to build relationships among themselves around issues that are really important to everybody. So getting at these real ideas. Yeah. And, and that's how I was, um, was working. I was doing a lot of, um, again, NGO work, working with directly the, the the German government, working with the Guatemalan government, uh, working with UNESCO, trying to align everybody on new policy that would be written into the national curriculum that would then be, uh, uh, you know, trainings and creativity would have to happen for the teachers in order for them to be. And the Minister of Education in Guatemala changes on average about every eight months. So 
you know, we'd come up with a plan coordinating between the Ministry of Culture and the Ministry of Education, and then uh, G GIZ, the, the government, uh, the, the German government organization that was funding, would be would be there coordinating as well, and we'd get something signed, and then the minister would change. And mm. Start all over again. Meanwhile, we still have the same uh, time frame from GIZ to get the same thing done, and so it was just like a trying to run around and. And that's what really uh, ended up pushing me away from this nonprofit model and toward uh, a more uh, capitalistic model of, you know, we're creating, um, we're creating value through our work and this value, it's also a yoga thing of the energy that I'm putting out, I not somehow need to, to be getting back in. Right? It's okay. physics, it's spirituality, it's, it's, mm -hmm all of these different laws converge on this idea of, okay, how can I do good in the world in ways that actually do, are good for me and not right. rely on, on somebody else to say, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'll pay you from my access so that you can do the good. And in the meantime, you have to work very hard up front to put in a lot of energy to even, without even knowing for sure if you're going to get that back. So the, uh, you know, the half of my work sustainability <laughs> right. becomes really clear at that and, point. And then ha sometimes as much as half of my work is spent, you know, making sure the receipts, the photos, the, the reports, the, the meetings, the, the, the back end, whereas really what I'm interested in doing is the work, you know, and so yeah. Uh, I met I met my wife, Jessie, and saw that her structure, which was that she set up a for profit uh, project which uh, sells um, crafts and, and textiles uh, made by Mayan women cooperatives that she works very closely with to develop this and, and has uh, fair trade uh, you know ensures that their their living wages ensures that um, but when she sells at retail there's there's enough money there that what's the, the, the margins she's she's developed a, a nonprofit that doesn't look for grants, but rather receives that from the, the business and then puts it back into those communities, not directly to the artisans, because that could create a, 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 a dynamic of, of increased wealth for those artisans, which increases um, jealousy and, and essentially at the end of the day makes those artisans have better houses with higher walls. Uh, right, right, right. But investing into the community and the education of the community, the nutrition in the community, so yeah. that, um, so that there's this general rising of the quality of life in these areas. Mm -hmm. And that is a very small scale organization. No one's heard of it. Um, uh, I Usta. <laughs> um, yeah. The work, you know, they, they give some grants to a, a middle school. They, um, they support nutrition and education in, in very uh, direct ways and, and over periods of time with very mm -hmm. limited groups. And, yeah. um, and, and that's not what USAID wants to see. Um, they want to see massive, large scale. They'll give you a million dollars if you can show that you're going to be able to bring in uh, to the U.S. economy new um, new products and, and 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 activate these people so that they have money to to be able to purchase as well. And so to buy the house with the big walls. Yeah, buy the house with the big walls. Buy the, mm -hmm. the, the the products from the U.S. that are are on their TVs. You know. The, Yes. So um, I saw a quote from you. So I want to, I'm going to tell a little story here because one of the things that's really important to me is the relationships. Um, the folks who I'm choosing to speak with are people who I have experienced, you know, you and I worked for the first time together just recently this last fe February, producing the metamorphosis um, event down in uh, Costa Rica. Um, at which point I learned of your wife, Je Jessie. Um, and Jessie, uh, I first came in contact with back in Guatemala at the time that I left my corporate career and made the decision to take this stockpile of money, of energy that I had saved up working in that career and to give it to projects that I felt would have a great impact. Um, and so I went to Guatemala with New Mundo where I found this amazing team of people who were 
demonstrating something that I, I thought I was seeing. I, I didn't expect to see this. And I want to share a quote that I found from you on your consulting website, which is that creativity is humanity's most powerful and underused tool. In spite of its infinite potential, it is what's missing in individuals and communities today. We are all steeped in educational and bureaucratic systems that reward menial compliance and deter independent thought. Now, this, that statement that you have there really sums up something from my first episode where I spoke with Christina. It's in your blog on, Car on your Caracol Consulting website, yes. Um, and I really appreciate it because it sums up something Christina and I talked about in depth, which is that we are all built in these systems. Um, and we, at various points in our life, for you it was right there at your graduation, having a choice to sit and listen to Alan Greenspan or go out and hear from the person in the square saying, please take your skills and do something good in the world. For me, it was up in my 26th floor building looking down on the square of the Occupy movement going, am, am I, is that me? Am I the 1%? <laughs> uh, what am I doing? <laughs> um, and so when I made that decision to jump off that tower, go to Guatemala with this crew, work in community building, I found the same things, right? I found even if you leave corporate America and you go to the nonprofit world, even if you leave the nonprofit world and you go in the activist world, those were, were people and we were built in these systems and we, without knowing it, perpetuate the systems by building new systems that still somewhat replicate that. And what you've described is really a key to that. It's forgetting that we have the creativity and the power to build a different system, but we have to recognize, we have to use those creative tools and be facilitated through a process that helps us recognize those parts of ourselves, those parts of our team, those parts of our community that are, that are built on that foundation of power and privilege dynamics. And that took away from us our critical thinking ability and our imagination and freedom to just play and see what comes up and to say, well, let's take that crap to his house and put it on his front yard. How can we do that in a really effective way? Um, I was really conscientious when I chose New Mundo as the organization that I wanted to work with. And when I got to Guatemala and I found this, this team of permaculture folks, of young, skilled, beautiful people uh, in crisis a little bit. They felt like they went on this tour, this adventure to have an impact, to bring their skills and services to these places, to build something, to do something good for a community without realizing in some way that they, there was an, an unintentional savior um, aspect built into that. And they were unhappy and heartbroken because they didn't get to get that moment of, I used my skills to help somebody, right? They were looking at it like, I didn't get to build that system, put in that garden. And so I used some of the facilitative team building skills that I had acquired, things that I saw you use, talking about Johari window, you know, looking at what are our unknown unknowns? How do we help people get to that? Where are our uh, learning edges? Let's push our borders a little bit here. And brought people together to say, we need a collective mission. You guys came on this tour thinking one thing because the vision was built by these three people over here. So you had an idea, but you weren't really bought into it. Now you've all had this collective experience together. You get to process and integrate that and as a team come together and create a new vision. What is, what is the mission that you guys want to do right now that would really, you know, with what you've seen and learned? And what it came out to was rather than saying, hi, I know how to build eco toilets, let me do that for you. Hey, I know how to build a, a schoolroom out of recycled bottles and plastic trash. What if we go to the communities and find out what do they need first? 
you know? <laughs> How do we go, go to a village there on Lake Adilan and find out that 5% of the children are dying every year from malnutrition? Why is that? What, what has, you know, we may not get all the way up river to what's causing that, but is there something that we collectively can come up with as a creative solution that will A, help alleviate that in some way and do it in a way that puts power back into these people's hands to start nourishing themselves more. We sent out that team of, of kids to several different villages. One of them was Panahachel. And one of the projects we ended up being able to do, and I'll put a link to this because there's a beautiful video about it out on Vimeo by the Republic of Light. But we helped Pusta um, integrate a, a garden that helps them teach their um, the plant. They grow the plants that they use to dye the thread. So they, they have their entire process from to create their fabrics, which the fabrics tell the story of their community, their family. That is their culture woven into their clothing, right? So creating that dye garden where they could bring the plants in, grow the plants, boil the plants, dye the fabric, and then teach that. Teach that art, that skill that is fundamental to their culture, to the children who don't have the access to those plants, to the ability to do that, and who would rather buy the clothes they see on the TV, right? <laughs> yeah. So um, it's interesting you mentioned that that project. Um, that's obviously one that's that's near and dear to our hearts. Jesse and I have spent a lot of time with yeah. Laura and Bradley, and they've actually since had to move the office um, from that space. Uh, mm. Last year, um, it was a rented space in a very strategic point. The, the landlord raised the rent. And they had no choice but to. They're in a new space now uh, with a new area and lots of new ideas, including making a, a tea house that engages people in different ways and then also brings them in and, and shows them. So that, it, it evolves, as all things do. Um, right. Another, another project that happened at that same point, uh, that New Mundo crew also was in San Marcos and built a solar dehydrator and a solar right. oven um, to, attach to a, a nutrition organization. Uh, this right. nutritional organization, Conohel, uh, right. conohel.org, K-O-N-O-J-E-L, that link there. Yep. Um, they, uh, they started as a place that was giving lunch to the most needy in the community to address that, um, that issue of of, uh, of malnutrition, which is chronic in so many children. Uh, not even that they're not eating enough, but that they're not eating enough the right things. Uh, only beans and tortillas and sometimes the junk food in the stores. So they have, they started with that, but their, their mission was never to, uh, to, to increase the number of people that they were serving, but rather go decreasing the number of people that needed their services. And, um, and I did a, a process with the, with the team and the board um, that, that, that was this kind of collaborative design where, where we looked at the situation and decided, okay, what does Kono Hell need? And we spent a lot of time, three days, um, intensively looking at this. And uh, what came out of it was that we needed to start a, uh, a cooperative that was going to use that, um, that, that solar dehydrator to create right. products that were nutritional and that would uh, we could sell to the foreign com community at a price that would allow us to sell it cheaper to the local community and that would sort of substitute the snacks that they were that they were currently eating and that would employ local women as their own bosses um, and that was a really beautiful thing and and then what we realized as we finished that up is looking you know looking around the room how many indigenous women are in this room right now <laughs> Right. Okay. Zero. Good. All right. Well, now what we need to do is we need to do this process again, but we need to make sure that the right people are at the table this time. And who are the right people? We had a, 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 a political um, organizer who ended up being mayor uh, the next, the next one in the next term. So he's the current mayor of San Marcos was at, the, at this design session. Um, there was uh, um, Isaias and his wife who are, uh, 
for uh, entrepreneurs and, in, in the cacao business, and they're also they're also Mayan um, Akich, uh, which is the the spiritual leaders. Um, there mm. were uh, women from the evangelical church. There were uh, women who worked in the kitchen of Konohel that are basically illiterate. There were foreigners. There was this broad diversity of people that, that care about San Marcos coming together to address how can we improve the quality of life in San Marcos. And we went through this process, uh, which we developed uh, through Imahitlan, which is called uh, Holistic Action Planning for Innovation. Um, and it's, or, or happy, but it's initials, which is a, a nice <laughs> coincidence. Uh, and so, so we did a happy session with them, which is uh, essentially two months meeting for four hours every week. Um, and we used our creativity not only to support uh, them in, under, in coming up with a, a solution, but also into understanding the interrelated nature of the challenges that they're facing in their lives. And, and that was what one of the, the nearly illiterate um, Mayan women said to me at one point was, before this, I never understood how the, the, the challenges my family are facing are interconnected with what's happening in the community. Uh, right. Alcoholism was something that me and my family were dealing with. Uh, the, the no money, no, you know, uh, rough education system were all things that we were dealing with. And through this process of post-it notes and, and analysis and, and moving back, moving as a group through these things, they, they were for the first time being listened to. Their voice was being taken into account. Their ideas were being put down on a piece of, piece of paper and added to the board and then discussed later by everyone in the group. And through that process, they, their, their self-esteem and their creative self-efficacy was increased. And their, also, their concept of how these challenges were interrelated in their community. And they were then able to, to pick one of them, which was uh, the challenge that they chose was that there are no uh, economic opportunities for youth and, and, and women in, that, are, that are stable, that are productive, and that are, that are dignified in, in this community. Because they realized that, that by, by solving that challenge, they'd be able to get at some of the other challenges like alcoholism, like, like right. uh, education. And so, so it's one thing to go into a community and say, okay, what do you guys need? And, and the, the, the standard resistance to that from government, from NGOs is they're just going to say, we need a soccer field because that's what right. they always say. And right. there's some truth to that because that's what's on the top of the mind. But when we get into a process where we're actually doing the understanding and studying together, then we develop people's uh, understanding of their community and the interrelated n nature of the challenges that they're facing. And at that point, we can start to prioritize, okay, supporting each other in all of these processes and making them the uh, consensus-based where we move forward when everybody's on board. And once we've gotten down to the core values and worked on relationships between each other, these processes flow much more, um, much more fluidly than then we often think, oh no, you know, uh, consensus. Oh no, I don't want to go there. We'll never get anywhere. Um, <laughs> it's true. Uh, the Kula Collective, we decided our values were such that we needed to operate as a board that worked in consensus. Mm -hmm. Do we take longer to do things? Yes, for sure. Some things. Other things, because we're together and all invested, flow in ways that, that no other business would be able to do. So. And, and it's happening along line with our values. So I really like what you said about um, coming together with this group and saying, okay, these three people created this vision. How can we create something that's inclusive and that's gonna motivate everyone? Um, and I think when, when I do uh, work with, as consulting with, with businesses, that's the, that's the central aspect of my, my consultancies. I went and worked with a plastic factory in Mexico City where we brought together every employee, first I did one-on-ones with everybody and sort of developed relationships, understood what they were facing, brought people mm -hmm. together in different groups to understand each other and to start to prioritize that challenge that they were facing and then work with everybody to come up with the solutions using their creativity, using different processes, design methodologies to come up with some small solutions. And that was another thing I learned in community organizing that you come into hey. community that's, that's crime ridden, that has, you know, drug lines going out the doors and kids have to walk by it on their way to school where their education sucks and like all these problems the first thing to do in that community is to put a stop sign in 
Why? Yeah. Because then that's going to make it a little bit safer, but most of all, it's going to teach them they're, they're going to be able to learn the, their, their own power. They're going to be able to interface with the, the, the city. They're going to be able to learn how to research. Okay. If we want this, this is who we talk to. This is how we talk to them. This is how that resulted. It's a, it's, it's a kind of a prototype model where we do small achievable uh, actions that will mm -hmm. then uh, increase the group's ability to do larger and larger things. Their creative self-advocacy, essentially. Right. Beautiful. I want to hop over. So, well, I'm gonna, just gonna mention a couple other things that I saw were really interesting. One thing we didn't go into too much is the sustainability of doing this work in community building. So I used to joke when I started our Sacred Acres, my impact center in Washington, that we were striving for sustainability. And what a dreadful thing to put upon myself by saying I'm striving towards sustainability. I'm basically like announcing we are not sustainable right now, but that was true. We weren't sustainable at that point. I was putting in more than I was getting out. Um, and in a lot of, a lot of times, um, we, if you choose not to take the route of, I'm going to go get the money, then we often go a little too far on that sometimes and compromise our ability to really take good care of ourselves in order to have a powerful impact on the world. And then sometimes we can swing a little bit on that extreme and go to the other side of the pendulum of, I can't take care of anything unless I'm taking care of myself. So I'm just going to do my meditating and inward work and believe that the world's going to change because I'm doing that. Um, I don't just think there's a healthy balance that needs to be found between the two of those. I think it's moving. I don't, you know, I think we go through cycles of what we need in our lives. What is our comfort level? Um, you have a, um, a TED talk. And I was really excited to see it and then I clicked on it and then I was like, here I am married to a Costa Rican Spanish speaker and Zach's talking in Spanish and I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> I wasn't able to follow it. I tried so hard, but because I'm an excellent researcher, I kept looking on YouTube and I found your English translation. And I was so excited to see what you shared on that because you know, that intersection of taking good care of ourselves and being a force for good in the community and living a life in alignment with our values, which requires surrounding ourselves with people in places that are aligned with our values. Um, you need all of those three things. They have to be in balance. And there are challenges that every person coming who's coming into looking for how can I become not just sustainable, but regenerative? How can I be so thriving in this world that people who are around me are also doing better because I'm doing so well? And how do we help ripple that out into the world? You addressed in your TED talk, which I'll also link on here, um, a couple of challenges that you personally experienced in learning how to address the challenges at the intersection of each of those different places. Um, and I really appreciated that because I really believe well, that's why I'm doing these conversations now, because I think um, it's time to harvest the wisdom of the experiences that so many people who have been working to change how we live together, how we work together towards a more verdant way of being in harmony with nature. Um, people can get really discouraged because they run into the challenges at one of those intersections and may just turn around and run and say, you know what, community is not for me. I'm just going to go back, get my simple paycheck, have my own house, not have to worry about who does the dishes. <laughs> um, so you, at the end of your, um, your TED talk, you, you give a couple of questions and I really appreciated those questions. Um, and I'll share this online. We have, uh, we have a little bit of time left to have a conversation. Um, so business in a good way, 
that was the title of your TED Talk. I, um, I want to touch on that and hear from you on that. And then I want to hear how that circles back to where you are right now. Um, what a beautiful experience I had there at Seven Springs, um, your retreat center there in Tennessee at the base of the Smoky Mountains. To meet the family, um, I just really felt that coming full circle, almost like the hero's journey aspect where we go out into the world uh, with, in, in our quest uh, and we gather things and then we come home. We bring it back to our families um, and you, uh, your family is expanding and you're creating a beautiful thing there in your community with the skills and the relationships you've developed. Um, tell me what, what's, what's up, what, where are you at right now and what, what's going forward? So th there's a, there's a, there's a, there was a key moment in my, in my life. I was working for Earth Rights Institute. Um, we were collaborating with a beautiful woman um, whose, whose name is uh, Marta. Um, uh, and she, uh, she's from El Salvador uh, and she's very big in the UN, uh, women's rights. Um, and she was collaborating with us uh, and also indigenous rights. Uh, she was collaborating with us on some of our projects. And um, after a while of you know, working together, she brought me aside. Um, little little white haired woman says uh saquito you know <laughs> you've been in guatemala a long time you've probably learned a lot of things while you're here probably learned that we don't need your help right mm. we are really good at organizing ourselves uh the problem papito <laughs> is that whenever we get organized the gringos come down and cut the heads off of our leaders so go home to your people. She was very excited that I was going to be in the, in the Southeast, you know, the, the Bible belt, like the center of, 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 of need for, for the kind of uh, creative self-efficacy that we're talking about, kind of ability to, to introspect and understand and, and align the, this idea of, of vision with, with understanding, you know, that, that the way that I see divinity really matches other people much more than it di diverges. Um, those kinds of things are just so the community aspect of it, just so necessary, particularly in this area of the country of the United States. She says, go home and organize there, like do your work there. Um, she was very instrumental in ending the war in El Salvador because she came to the United States and organized people to march on Washington, convince Reagan to stop funding the war in El Salvador. And, um, I think as, as a citizen of this country, and particularly as a white Harvard educated male, um, I, had a lot of, I had a lot of white guilt uh, uh, for a while. Um, you know, I remember going to Alex, my Puerto Rican friend in, in, in middle school, going to his community in North Philly uh, to play at his house and like jumping on the old burnt out mattresses next to his house and like, that was, you know, sort of normal for, for that. But then like recognizing how different it was for him to come to my, definitely not rich, but a middle-class community um, still in the city, um, such diversity existed, such uh, di difference. In, in, and so I think I, w I walked for a while with this kind of burden, the, the white man's burden, right? Of like, how can I get out of um, this space of guilt and, and I, I, as you were saying, I, I, I lived very poorly for a while. I wasn't paying off my student loans. Um, and it took, uh, it took a, a failed marriage. It took a lot of health issues. It took a lot to actually turn around and start to look at things from, from a perspective of my, my own value and my, my own um, as, as my friend who's a sp uh, a Mayan spiritual guide, uh, Felipe says, you know, God doesn't want us to live this miserable life. Um, wants us to be happy, wants us to have nice things. She wants us to, 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 to be in good community. Um, this is, this is how we express ourselves in the world. And particularly as somebody that's, that's a consultant for creativity, you know, it's the same kind of thing of, 
how am I creating my own life? And if I'm not doing it to the, to, to what I want it to be, how can I come and talk to you about that? So, so I started doing more consulting and, uh, I, it's interesting right now talking about intersections. I'm here at, uh, our, um, a retreat center, seven Springs, uh, seven Springs retreats in outside Maryville, Tennessee. Um, that was created uh, by my wife, Jessie, her parents, Herman and Mary, and her cousins who were living here at the time and supporting. And now it's a, a different couple that's living here and supporting. But we did a collaborative design process together. And I had known my future, my, at that point, they were future in-laws. I had known them for, you know, less than a year, you know, spent a few days together. And there I was facilitating a process. And um, you've met Herman, and he's not very excited about posting <laughs> Uh, and it was uh it was a process uh that it, and so so very quickly the creative uh, thinking that that i like to do with people div divide into lunar and solar thinking lunar is when we're coming up with lots of ideas and solar thinking is when we're choosing between them so lunar is going wide solar is deciding uh, we often combine those together at the same do them both at the same time and, and that's something that both Jesse's parents are classically good at. They're good at solaring the lunar process. So uh, we could have tents. No, we can't have tents because we're not camping uh, registered uh, for business. And, and we got her to calm down, you know, I sort of uh, Mary, future and mother-in-law, like, uh, please just be quiet right now. <laughs> kind of thing. And like, uh, Herman, could you uh, just wait on your judgment for a minute? And like, let's expand <laughs> To the point where we said, okay, well, what about yurts and not yurts? But then now we have six beautiful yurts that right now people are staying in in the midst of a 25-day yoga teacher training um, mm. that uh, is a result of another cr uh, f creative um, collaborative design process that I, that I did with Jesse and some of her friends who were involved in yoga teacher trainings with another school that weren't happy with the school. So as, as our co-founder, Kobe, says, we spent you know, five days coming up with two sentences, which are our vision and our mission. At that point, we we're clear enough about that, that we were able to, to, to build that into a business that, again, intersections, you know, now uh, Kula Collective is here and we're, we're working with 10 amazing, beautiful people to bring them into, the, into, their, into their spaces of reflective light and, and, and how they can bring that out into their communities, building the, our vision in the world through in that way. And we also have this, this beautiful retreat center, which has, um, which is hosting this experience right now. And so, you know, yesterday I was installing screens and, uh, you know, digging a, a compost pit. And, you know, there's lots of that kind of duality that exists in my life now. You know, sometimes I'm on a Skype interview or sometimes I'm doing that or, you know, um, yeah. doing educational consulting in the area. But because our family is growing now, because uh, we are, we're about, to, I'm about to be a parent, which I never have been. Um, it brings a new level of uh, stability and focus into my life, which I feel like the, the groundwork has been laid for. So, you know, at 41, I'm finally ready to start taking on the kind of responsibility that that entails. And it feels, it feels really good. It feels like I have the, the experience at building business in a good way um, through collaborative efforts um, that bring all the people on board first with the vision and then look, look at how we can bring it into the world. Um, enough that, that we can, you know, I can, I can support others in that, that vision as well which is what we did at Metamorphosis, right? We, we got all these people together who are, uh, who are passionate about uh, finding their place in, in, this, uh, in this movement of, of creating a better world and, and empowering them to, to, to design their own creative uh, path is uh, something I'm really passionate about. So not only the collaborative design process, but the individual design process, using uh, your own creativity and, and design principles to come up with a, a plan for yourself and a prototype plan, you know, and that can then evolve into a larger plan. But that's what we use our time for in, in, in the metamorphosis journey is to 
look at the the ways that uh, uh, a caterpillar turns into a butterfly and mirror our own uh, creative self-efficacy awakening on those same lines. And um, and that's 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 where we met. That's that's where we um, had a chance to to step into um, this guidance of these kinds of experiences together in a way that was. Um, it was so fluid, it, it almost felt like it, it was planned, you know? And that right. uh, comes down to us having a shared vision, that, that from that sh place of shared vision, there are no questions about how you're gonna feel about this or how we, what this needs to be. Like, there's just a recognition that, oh, this is an idea that Danielle has about this because of her experience around that, because of what she's seen, because of what she's observing, I'm on board, let's do it. Um, and there's no question about where you're coming from because there's just an assumption that we're we're on the same page we have the same vision and that's the kind of thing that gives fluidity to, to a business that works on a consensus model it's not you know the decision making process it, it's the relationship and it's the understanding that we're engaged in the same vision and path in life right i really like how you put that find finding uh folks who are coming there uh have the opportunity to find their place in the movement because we are all in a movement and that's part of this shared vision and the shared values is we see where we are, are right now and we have this vision and this dream um, in our imagination of how the world can be and many of us are sharing that vision already uh, i have a lot of theories on why that is <laughs> but the fact is it's true and we to find, we develop these shared values that we can operate under. And when we find people who share that vision and are demonstrating consistent actions in alignment with the values that will create that together, it really empowers us to trust one another, which is really the big underlying foundation of that. Um, you can have an instant relationship with someone when you are quickly able to determine that we share the same values, we share an intention, and we we want to work towards the same thing. So we can trust one another to make decisions towards that. And um, uh, we're we're at our hour mark here, um, and I know we both have plenty more things to go experience. Um, but I want to just kind of end on that metamorphosis note that. We had to share that experience together last year, doing it with the people who steward that place, with the people who are responsible for that land, for the waters there, for the people who choose to come there, and to share that experience ourselves so we can now hold that container for the next set of people that are gonna come in next February. And I'm really looking forward to doing that. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what else you have going on this, so this October. You have a permaculture jam there on the land. Yeah, um, I go to a thing called Mind Camp outside uh, Toronto, which is a, a nonprofit um, gathering of about 300 people that um, facilitators uh, get a discount. So you have about 100 people of the 200 people, 250 people are facilitating something, and it encourages an egalitarian uh, sharing. Uh, process where everybody is essentially a facilitator of something um, and, it, mm -hmm. and it just really brings people together in a, in a very open way and so based on that model we're um, we're going to be having a gathering where lots of different people are sharing their gifts and workshops that are going to be you know simultaneous throughout the days uh, there will also be some natural building projects going on at the same time so that people can get their you know uh, if they want to spend a day uh, learning how to do cob there's going to be uh, a construction project uh, going on. If people want to learn how to do earthworks design, there's going to be some of that happening. Uh, gardening, different different aspects of, of things um, that we're working on here to, to make this uh, place a little bit more um, regenerative uh, and, and along permaculture principles. So the, all that will be happening sort of simultaneously. And we'll be working on some collaborative design throughout the course of the, the five days we'll be together to come up with a shared vision. So we won't go any farther in terms of creating a solution to get there, but, but this community itself will, will come out of this with an idea of, okay, these are our values. These are, this is what we're aligned around. This is why we're together here. This is why we came together. So um, it's gonna be a beautiful, uh, beautiful gathering. 
the other the other thing we're having here in uh, in July, uh, the end of June, beginning of July, is uh, is a facilitation intensive, which is another passion of mine. Is um, bringing uh, giving people an opportunity to learn and practice the skills of of you know what we call hashtag space holding, right? <laughs> like um, what it is, <laughs> how how we do that. Um, the, the, the pedagogy behind it, the, the design processes around coming up with, uh, with, with a standards-based curriculum that we can measure, um, ways that we can give and receive feedback, which my friend calls feed forward. How can we uh, have this be more um, intentional and uh, developmental? So, so that's, a, that's, that's a part of a cooler, off, cooler offering, a facilitation intensive that's a six-day process of learning learning and experiencing lots of things in the morning and then practicing in the afternoon not only uh how to facilitate but how to give feedback to the peers that are facilitating and um beautiful oh i know I, folks will be really excited to hear about that um yeah it, it's it, it's often a bit of a joke the space holding thing i'm going to hold space for you and yet creating the environment for creativity to flourish uh, you can't undervalue that. <laughs> Beautiful. Zach, it's been such a pleasure to have some time with you. Likewise, I think we got more time th today than we did while you were out here for the Right? For the I know. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> we did get some quality time with Loki, which was nice. Yeah, that was really the important thing for me, was to get him away from all of the screens. <laughs> Which he still, of course, managed to find one a few times a day to, to keep from losing his mind. But we got some great outdoor time together. Thank you for that. It was a great place to spend time as family. Well, I hope to see Any you. other thoughts? Um, yeah, just uh, uh, I really, really appreciate the way that you're, you're bringing um, your experiences forward into a, a place that's um, shareable. You know, this, this kind of conversations uh, can be a really powerful way for people to, to drop in on on uh, on what's going on as, as we're as we're creating this new paradigm you know let's co-create it and, uh, it is it is and it's important that we talk about it and be able to share and reflect for one another from different perspectives of a shared experience whether it be in the same place like we shared at metamorphosis at the same time or having moved through uh, places in Guatemala at different stages of something and simply sharing this beautiful home planet. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Thank you, Danielle. Lots of love. Yeah. Great. I'll, um, I'll be getting this posted in a few days and have some information up front and back and ways people can get in touch with you to learn more about what you're doing and also to um, get engaged in projects like what we've talked about here. Amazing. Beautiful. Thanks. Thank you. Ciao. Bye.